Sometimes you stumble upon a piece of art that just speaks to you. Whether it's a painting, a book or movie, a video game, maybe a song, it could be anything. At first, you may not be able to tell why it stands out to you. It could be the themes, the overall message, maybe it reminds you of something. Whatever it is, it stirs an emotional response from you. For me, these works usually resemble each other in some way, like they share themes, a premise or plot point, and even if I couldn't identify it at first, I'll usually be able to see why I was so drawn to something after some reflection. Occasionally, there is a piece of art that I'll fall in love with that is nothing like the others. I'm not drawn to it for personal reasons or anything like that. In fact, it might not be much like anything else I usually like, or maybe it's just way more unique than anything I'm into. That brings me to the piece of work that has infected my brain for the past six or seven months. Maybe more. I'm not great with keeping track of time, okay? It's a me- a ma all right, let me be clear about something. I've always pronounced manga like manga, even after finding out it was wrong, because number one, habit, and number two, and this is important, weebs really get mad. Yeah, if you're wondering, I'm very petty. Anyway, my gaming group chat was giving me shit about it the other day, ragging on me for mispronouncing the word. So, you guys win. I'll pronounce it manga. Anyway, the first time I encountered Blame was a few years ago. I started it, and within a few chapters, I was unsettled enough to stop reading. One of my biggest fears is infinity. Don't ask me why, but seemingly endless, gigantic spaces and objects, such as mountains, oversized skyscrapers, space, the ocean, terrify me beyond belief. Infinity as a concept sends proverbial chills down my spine. Blame embraces this terror, using the infinite to impact the reader. An infinite journey, an infinite setting, infinite sadness, an endless cycle of repeating events, places, people, all the things that keep me up at night, present within one mm, mm, Japanese comic book. Thinking about Blame, the protagonist Killy is usually enough to put me on edge. His journey is endless, but he is relentless. Programming cannot be stopped, and I believe he is very much programmed. No matter how hopeless, how eternal, how impossible, no matter how many steps he's thrown back, he continues. Nothing makes him hesitate or think twice. He's an emotionless machine concerned with one thing and one thing only, and he will prioritize this over everything. It's hard to say if Killy thinks about anything other than, are there humans, and I'm looking for the net terminal gene, which are basically the same thought. There is a moment where we see Killy's humanity, when he meets a character who mistakes Killy for a healer. Killy immediately tells the guy he isn't a healer, but later on, when the character is mortally wounded, Killy tells him, it's okay, the healer is here, an attempt at comforting someone in their dying moments. It makes you wonder who Killy used to be, or who the person whose genetic data he has was in their time. I believe Killy has the genetic data of the protagonist in Knights of Sidonia, something I can't prove and won't waste time trying to prove, but if it is true, this brief moment of humanity very much reminds me of that character. This tiny part makes you wonder what this journey has done to him. Was there a time when he wasn't cold enough to smile while announcing he killed babies? Was there a time when he was a regular person with a normal life? It's sad to think how this journey has transformed him into a killing machine with only a glimpse here and there of any compassion. Shibo isn't far behind, her story seems to be internally wrapped up with Killies. In Blame version 0.11, salvaged dish by Shibo, an anime that was intended as a companion piece to the manga, we see that Shibo has been repeating this cycle alongside Killy for seemingly just as long. The series is six episodes that are about five or six minutes each, and even if you've read the manga, they are a bit cryptic, but from what I can tell, they seem to be either Shibo or Kelly's memories, records of their past together in this cycle. This anime heavily implies that the woman in the beginning of the manga with the dog is a version of Shibo, something I didn't catch when reading, but it's hard to miss in version 0.11. The description of Blame 0.11 is as follows. 3,000 years have passed since the future was buried. Countless armies of machines are all that remain of human civilization. Without orders, they build and build, swallowing up the Earth, Moon, and the entire solar system within the intricate steel and concrete levels of the megastructure. Somehow, in this environment, the silicon creatures have come to exist. All that has been known about them until now is their goal. Invade the net sphere, eradicate all organics. Our only weapon is this salvage data disk from the engineer Shibo. It contains information that might allow humans to restore order to the world. Again, the size of the city is nothing more than outlandish, something that seems endless and as though it has no beginning or end, like a new god built of metal that is slowly eating up the real god's creations. A fucked up thought, if you ask me. My first introduction to the writer of Blame was Knights of Sidonia, 
an anime I happened to come across on Netflix some years ago. Since then, I've read the manga, which deserves its own video. Something interesting I found out about Satomo Nihei, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, I I'm sorry, is that he didn't become interested in doing manga until later in life. From an interview I found on the Barnes & Noble website, I'll link it in the description, Nihei's approach comes in part from his life experience. While most manga creators learn their craft in a series of, you see, you see, this is why I pronounce the word manga, 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 because I'm like, I just fucked up the word craft. I'm like, they're craft. Like, no, the word is fucking craft. Look, anyway, Nihei's approach comes in part from his life experience. While most manga creators learn their craft. In a series of apprenticeships, Nihei started out working in an office, then worked in construction for a while before moving to New York for a year to focus on making, God, I fucking hate this word, manga. During his years in construction and later working for a design firm, he learned to think about structures and interior spaces as well as how to draw them. His technical training shows up in the worlds he creates for his manga, vast spaces filled with jumbles of wires, ducts, and structural elements such as girders. The city in Blame is its own character, one that is commanding and captures every scene it is in, which is pretty much all of them. The city offers a lot to dissect, as I believe the environment in Blame is more than just a daunting backdrop. I found there were times the feelings of the panel were represented in symbolic ways in the background, the most notable being the rain towards the very end of the manga. I am convinced this rain represents sorrow and it isn't simply there to tell you Killy is close to the end of his journey. The rain would imply a natural environment nearby, so naturally you would think, yeah, that's what this rain means. But in my opinion, it's showing sadness and sorrow feelings that Killy has that he just can't express because he's just, he's been alone for God knows how many years by the time we get to the end. This panel right here rips my heart out. Nothing needs to be said. The eyes don't have to be shown. The rain, the silence, and knowing what he's looking at are enough to tear me apart each time. To me, this image invokes the feeling of an endless cycle. The darkness of the panel emanates ominous vibes, seeming to say, this journey is fruitless and you will be stuck until the end of time. These panels in chapter 56 are claustrophobic, giving the reader the feeling of descending deeper into the unknown, deeper into a never-ending abyss, feeling trapped. As sprawling as the city is, perhaps it's the size of the galaxy, maybe just the solar system, either way, it is massive, the journey feels suffocating. Killy doesn't seem to have free will, as we later find out he is a provisional safeguard, something that even the wiki hasn't defined. It's not explained very well in the manga, or at all. From what I can tell, provisional safeguards have a duty to protect humans, whether they have the net germinal <laughs> net germinal. From what I can tell, provisional safeguards have a duty to protect humans, whether they have the net terminal gene or not. Before this revelation, when he's still clueless about his origin, Killy questions whether other humans can see numbers in front of their eyes. The wiki notes that the definition of human in blame is loose as hell, something I couldn't help but notice as well. They upload memories and share them through devices, back up their data, barely eat, walk for years on end. These characters hardly fit any definition of human I'd use. All that aside, the alphanumerics Killy is seeing in front of his eyes are a result of scanning the environment and life forms around him. He's been on this journey for so long, he's forgotten who and what he is. He insists more than once that he is human, but this isn't true. According to the writer, Killy is about 3,000 years old at the start of the manga. He's been on this journey for so long, he's lost anything that would resemble humanity, at least from my perspective. Killy doesn't seem to feel too much pain. He heals extremely quickly, he's got a super overpowered weapon, he cannot be killed, and he is programmed to continue searching for the net terminal gene until he finds it, and that gene may not exist anymore. The only thing that seems to give him any joy in life is killing the silicon life. As you read through Blame, though I'd say you feel your way through it as opposed to reading, Killy runs into various characters, as any protagonist does on their journey. What is significant here is the fact that Killy has likely met all of these characters before, perhaps multiple times. When I got to the end of this story, I was convinced that this kid right here is the same kid we see in the beginning. The cycle is starting over. Remember, the kid in the beginning was described by the Silicon Life as a genotype from before the infection. This means they have the net terminal gene. I'm not entirely certain if the kid looking somewhat like Shibo is intentional or just art style, but it is something I took note of. 
Sort of like how Killy looks an awful lot like Tanakaze from Knights of Sidonia, and I'm not convinced that this is an accident, though again, it could just be art style. It's not. In a strange way, the city has more emotional depth than Kelly. It's huge, growing, but despite that, it works as a prison for all who are left in it. It doesn't matter who or what you are, you are not safe in this city. The exterminators and safeguards can show up anywhere at any time, threatening you within an instant, giving you no time to react and defend yourself. If you view these as extensions of the city, you begin to see an environment that wants nothing more to extinguish the, the remaining life, organic, artificial, whatever. This city no longer is for humans. It has continued to be built by senile machines who lost their ways thousands of years ago when humans stopped giving directives. Now the builders build nonstop, destroying anything in their paths and endlessly expanding the city. The city has grown so much the administration doesn't know how to approximate the size anymore. The city is a funhouse labyrinth that even contains areas that seem to bend time. Time travel itself is nothing more than a sneeze in this series anyway, as the administration and at least one artificial intelligence engage in something called forwarding, which takes someone back in time. And speaking of time, that's another thing about this manga. It makes you feel the time as you read it. The large panels that reduce Kelly and Shibo down to the size of needles, like seriously, sometimes it's hard to find them, work to give you a feel for just how long these two have been walking and how much longer they will continue to walk. Months? years, decades, sometimes what seems to be centuries pass in the matter of a chapter or a few. There is one chapter where 14 years go by, another where 10 happens within the turn of a few pages. Details like this make Blame feel longer than it is, but not in a bad way. This is a compliment, not an insult. The manga is only 65 chapters, but it covers a lot with very little dialogue and breathtaking art meant to induce specific feelings at specific times, something it does brilliantly. The oversized panels showing huge swaths of the city, combined with art techniques meant to draw your eye to certain areas, work perfectly to tell a story without many words. Things that loom and tower over us also tend to make us think about a lot of time, at least that's true for me, and that technique is used over and over in Blame. At the time of recording this video, I have read through Blame in its entirety at least three times, as well as read various interpretations, I've read Noise, Knights of Cydonia, and Biomega, and even with all of that, I can confidently say that I do not fully comprehend the depth of Blame, not the full meaning behind it, or the overall message, if there even is a message. What I do believe is that whether intentionally or not, Blame works as a very powerful warning against AI. If you look at the situation in the city, you can see that this happened because of us embracing artificial intelligence. With AI art becoming so popular and blowing up in the mainstream, I think Blame is a perfect way to shit in people's Wheaties about AI. The future implications of AI are terrifying. See also I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, another work I've made a video about. Science fiction has done a damn good job at predicting many, many things. Chips in our head, androids and robots who seem to be sentient, mind uploading, and AI control are the last few things on the list. And they all look to be completely possible given where we are headed technologically. Okay, I'm not sure about mind uploading, that one is a toss up, but never underestimate the human ability to disregard stark warnings and continue to research dystopianly dangerous things. What the fuck? That is not a word, Melissa. I wrote the word dystopianly. Oh. I'm like, that is not a word. <laughs> think about where artificial intelligence is at today. Now think about 20 years from now, 30, 40, 50, 100. We will keep advancing the technology and eventually we will get to the point where androids are walking around and merely a mechanical machine. She's a socially intelligent robot, capable of greeting you, enjoying a conversation, and remembering it going forwards. Humanoid is socially smart and Atlas agile. Emika lies somewhere in the middle. Indeed, a human-like artificial intelligence needs a human-like artificial body to evolve and grow. Emika can talk and communicate with a mastery of human expression and body language. In one video, the robot pushes a finger away that was touching its nose. This is even starting to freak us out. Posted Engineered Arts, the company behind the machine. Yeah, that's already happening. Just think about it for a second. Think about what things are going to be like when we already have androids walking around right now. Think about 50 years from now. 
What's worse is that humans are arrogant and do not listen to warnings. They take warnings as blueprints for future dystopias that they think will never come into fruition. They're like, oh, we would never let that happen. But newsflash, the US is a dystopia. So are a lot of other countries on this earth. But since I live in the US, I'll comment on that. There are many parts of this country, maybe the whole country, that strike me as dystopian as fuck. That's a technical term. And this is why blame is so terrifying. It's a grim depiction of the future, a hopeless one that is mostly that way due to unchecked artificial intelligence. Tilly's journey is a bleak one. He's searching an ever-growing structure the size of the solar system or galaxy, perhaps even bigger, for something that might be non-existent. Time is meaningless to him, and the other humans, humanoids, creatures around him, well, it's meaningless to them as well. The silicon life, or synth humans as I often call them, are on the opposite mission of Killy, hunting down any remaining humans. And you start to think, they're not so bad. After all, they're just trying to survive. They would be wiped out if a human with the net terminal gene was found, because then humans would regain control of the city. Killy is stuck in an endless loop. And it seems Shibo, as well as the other characters, are too. We should be precautious when it comes to advancing artificial intelligence technology, mind uploading, and life extension methods that resemble insanity. These things can lead to a dystopian situation like we see in Blame if they aren't handled correctly. A work like Blame is extreme. When people look at it, they don't see a prediction or a warning. They see something that, like I said, could never happen. But there are so many things that we've said could never happen that have happened. I'm not even certain how people keep using this as an excuse not to think about the absolute state of the world. These are levels of copium I am unfamiliar with. The point of science fiction is to warn you. Like I always harp on about on this channel, this is why art is important. It puts the hard and uncomfortable truths in your face. Science fiction often presents worlds that are unfamiliar and familiar at the same time. You will see places with laws and traditions that seem irrational, ridiculous. There's no way that could happen. If you were a citizen of the United States, I need you to look at Congress for half a second and realize that some of these people are just dumber versions of villains in many dystopian books and movies. As you read through Blame, you begin to feel the time around you slow down. This is what I was trying to touch on earlier. You get sucked in. You can't help but feel like you're in this city, right alongside Killy on this journey. A feeling I believe is induced because the writer slash artist use techniques to draw you into the art, which in turn draws you into the story. In the beginning of the story, Killy has a book and he reads a sentence that mentions land or earth, depending on which translation you're reading. And he asks, what is land? Little things like this bothered me so much. To imagine a world where someone doesn't understand the concept of earth or land, it's just depressing. What scared me more than anything is that we can get there someday. People are addicted to social media and barely know what the outside world looks like, a thing that was happening long before the pandemic hit. If you spend any amount of time online, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, touch grass, which directly references this perpetually online and disconnected from the real world problem people face today. Like Serial Experiments Lane, another wonderful series that I can't say I fully understand, Blame seems to have predicted things like this way before most others were thinking about social media. No matter if you've had the story spoiled or not, I'd still say it's worth a read. Nothing anyone says about this series will do it justice. Its beauty is in how it immerses you. It is something that must be experienced firsthand. In my opinion, works like Blame need to be read by everyone. I fear it gives a warning that will not be heeded, but at the very least, it can offer an entertaining and disturbing journey to anyone willing to get on. It is a one-of-a-kind story, something that leaves you with a need to process what you just experienced for several hours after taking it in. Art that disturbs and makes us uncomfortable tends to teach us important lessons. <coughs> We shouldn't have smoked all that weed before I recorded. <laughs> hard truths we ignore or harsh realities we were unaware of. Sometimes it can make us look at the world around us and realize things about it we never saw before. This is the beauty of art that we cannot ignore. 